Yeah, one week full of tolerance, and I think you have already heard a lot about uh, DFT approaches, so what else can I tell you? Um, what I want to show you are some more technical details. So um, basically, these are the results of my PhD thesis, so I want to present dependence of follow-on properties on exchange correlation approximations, uh, finite size effects, which we have due to the supercell approach, and in an outlook I will give you some yeah, problems uh, which we have observed on the uh, follower and potential energy surface. Uh, a quick overview, I think, uh, uh, to uh, give you an overview what we have, what you can do. Basically, you can simulate uh, a follower using um, just properties you can calculate from a unit cell, which was uh, presented by Filiciano Justino this week, um, where you use the Cohen-Shad orbitals and energies from your DFT calculation and phonon band structure and electron phonon matrix elements from DFT. Uh, what you also can do is what you also have already what also have already been shown is you can create a supercell at initial distortion, and then you re remove a charge or add a charge to your cell and optimize. So, and I just listed some speakers, but there were, of course, more, uh, which have presented to uh, this charge supercell approach. But the question is, is there maybe something else? Uh, coming back to the charge supercell approach, uh, as I said, create supercell, initial distortion, remove charge, start relaxation, and if you're lucky, and, uh, you will maybe find after some time a polaron, which I've shown here for magnesium oxide using uh, the HSE functional. I will come back to uh, technical details in a few minutes. Using a 512 atom supercell, uh, where the black arrows show the displacements times 10, and what you can see is the logarithmic plot of the polar and eigenstate. Um, what you can see from here is that you have really um, a local, a strongly localized uh, charge on the central oxygen atom. So this is a whole polar one because we have removed the charge. Uh, but what you can also see, you have, I think, uh, yeah, some uh, tails all also on the other atoms. Um, once you have this polar and geometry, uh, again, uh, I'm repeating here uh, stuff people already told you, uh, you can uh, uh, calculate the binding energy, which you can use to judge um, uh, on polar and, uh, stability. Um, this is basically, uh, yeah, just uh, what I've plotted here is a configurational diagram. So this is your ground state material. And what you do uh, in case of the whole polar run, you remove an electron and then you start relaxation and maybe you find the polar run here. And the energy difference of the uh, perfect minus the polar run configuration gives you the binding energy. And what you can also uh, show here is uh, the polar run level which you either can calculate by the differences of the uh, um, highest occupied state um, of the of the polar run minus the highest occupied state of the um, uh, perfect configuration, which basically form a divalence band in the case of the uh, whole polar run. Uh, but you can also formulate in terms of ionization potentials what you can see here, because this is the ionization potential for the, of the perfect configuration minus the ionization potential of uh, distor the distorted configuration. Um, to study the uh, dependence of the, uh, uh, on the exchange correlation functional, we use the so-called uh, HSE functional, which uh, mixes part of exact exchange with uh, the PBE functional. And one important thing you have to know is that a PBE functional is quite cheap. 
you can basically simulate systems up to 10,000 atoms nowadays. But if you go, to, if you turn to HSE, this is really uh, very costly and you need a lot of computational power. What we do is to analyze the uh, dependence on the underlying exchange correlation functional. We change uh, this mixing uh, parameter. And what you obtain, for example, for alpha equals zero is basically the PBE functional, which is the same local functional, which is cheap. Whenever you have any fraction larger than zero, you have this uh, kind of expensive uh, calculation. So, uh, yeah, this is what I did. And coming back to uh, this whole fluorine and magnesium oxide, and this was calculated for this fraction of exact exchange for 0.4, which gives you the correct band gap. So this was one of my first steps. I just had this configuration and just uh, calculated the polar and binding energy for different fractions of exact uh, exchange. And what you can see is that you get a huge dependence on the polar and binding energy, where you can argue that ranges uh, in this uh, part are not really physical, uh, but uh, this range is really concerning because this is what people usually do. They either choose uh, alpha to fit some experimental band gap, or they use the so-called standard parameter, which is uh, uh, 0.25 um, uh, fraction of exacted change. And what you can see here, you get two different answers. Yeah? If you use uh, this uh, fraction of exact exchange, you, uh, the prediction would be, yes, there is a stable uh, whole polymer and magnesium oxide. If you use the other, um, you would uh, come to the conclusion uh, that there is no stable whole polymer. And this even holds if you allow all atoms uh, to relax, what you, uh, which uh, resembles the red um, Curve. So from this picture, looking at this small range around here, uh, uh, um, uh, a quantitative prediction uh, is uh, a qualitative prediction, and quantitative prediction of uh, following formation is not really possible, to be honest. Um, so where does it come from? Uh, uh, Stefan Lani already uh, also talked about this. There is a, a, a theorem which is called the IP theorem, uh, which uh, relates the slow, um, it states that the total energy is piecewise linear in between integer electron numbers, which I have shown here. And the slope is basically given um, here, for example, on this side by the uh, uh, highest occupied state. The slope of this would be the lowest uh, uh, unoccupied state. Um, however, for any um, uh, exchange correlation approximation, we have this known uh, errors, for example, self-interaction error, uh, which is the predominant error in, uh, for our uh, local and semi-local functional, which I've shown you, for example, for B PBE, which usually leads to a delocalization. Uh, uh, on the other hand, for example, orbital relaxation uh, due to the lack of missing correlation effects, um, which is prominent in the uh, Hartree-Fock or so-called exact exchange um, functional, tends to an over-localization. What I've shown you there, this is, corresponds to uh, alpha equal one. So to gain a little bit more insight into where this error comes from, we use this IP theory to reformulate uh, the binding energy. So here is the IP theory, but now with this uh, error of the exchange correlation functional included. And what we do, we use, uh, you use this uh, energy and plug it just into our definition of the binding energy. And where we end up is uh, like a, a second formulation of a binding energy, which you can nicely interpret because this is basically uh, the relaxation energy you have to pay uh, to the formula letters. And uh, the second part is basically the polar level, uh, which describes uh, the energy gain due to the whole localization. 
And what we have here is, in addition, the, uh, um, uh, the error of the exchange correlation functional. But if you put it there or there, it doesn't matter. So we have basically two definitions of uh, binding energies. This one, what we have derived right now, uh, only includes properties of the neutral cell. On the other hand, uh, uh, this binding energy includes only quantities of the charge system. And the only difference is basically uh, the error in the exchange correlation functional. Uh, this was not my idea. This was uh, um, uh, present in the literature starting in 2011. Uh, and what we can see here, now we compute, coming back to the whole form uh, in the magnesium oxide, is uh, again the black curve is the binding energy calculated from the charged cell, and the red curve is the binding energy which we have just derived now. What you can see here is uh, the red curve has a much lower dependence on the underlying exchange functional. And by the way, uh, where both lines crosses, basically this is what uh, Stefan Lani has told you is the optimal alpha parameter where, ex where the exchange correlation, uh, the error in the exchange correlation functional cancels. Moreover, more importantly, across, uh, uh, for all fraction of exacted change, using this uh, reformulated binding energy, we can predict a stable whole polar run in magnesium oxide, which is a really um, um, uh, advantage of this formulation. And what we also can see is based on the assumption that uh, uh, a huge change in this um, quantity indicates uh, dependence on the exchange correlation functional, then the exchange correlation uh, functional is basically um, originated in a charge system, which is somehow also understandable because the neutral system, magnesium oxide, is basically a closed shell system. Now, if you remove a charge, you basically open your, your closed shell and all the problems start, um, which are well known in the field of uh, density functional theory. Uh, I will, yeah, I know, uh, it's not really nice uh, to see here, but I will show later. Uh, this was just to demonstrate uh, the relation of uh, uh, the exchange, um, exchange correlation functional dependence. So now that we now can calculate binding energy, we still have to face the question, we have to rely on a, uh, we have to find a um, follower in geometry. So right now we only can do this in a charged cell. Uh, this is quite easy, basically minimize the uh, energy here. Uh, you, you are doing this by uh, minimizing the forces um, until reach uh, the zero, uh, zero. However, how does this look, uh, how does this work uh, at the uh, uh, neutral potential energy surface? Because there we would have to find the minimum of, uh, of this quantity. And therefore, we would have to calculate uh, the forces uh, from this to uh, do the same procedure. And this was a nice idea by Sadi and co-workers. And using uh, Yanak's theorem, which basically relates the highest occupied state to the, uh, to the partial derivative of the total energy with respect to the number of electrons. And what they and just what they do is you can do a finite difference approximation of this derivative, put it in here again, and what you have then again is just the sum of total energies, where you easily can calculate uh, the forces from. So this is really easy to implement in any DFT code. You basically do just uh, you probe your, your your system just with a tiny charge, and from this you can. Uh, then you can calculate uh, forces on this potential energy surface. And indeed, I could show you the same picture, but what we do find, even using PBE, is um, uh, we find the following geometries, which is really promising. So we can avoid using hybrid functionals 
to find tolerant ge geographies by using this um, special approach suggested by Sadie and co-workers. Okay, so this is basically uh, this kind of new approach. Um, uh, what you do is that you do a kind of a special optimization using um, a, a corrected forces. Um, so now we have somehow overcome these problems of this huge exchange correlation functional uh, error and dependence. And there is a sec second problem, which is called a final side uh, effect. And uh, this is due basically what you have to imagine is you have your charge at the center of your cell, which creates a, a Coulomb potential. And basically due to your supercell approach, the tails of this uh, defect potential interact. And this uh, generates uh, some spurious interaction energy, which we basically can correct. And I, this was um, basically started to dis discuss by Markov and Peiner in uh, 1995, uh, but was generalized to finite um, density distribution. So if we know analytic analytically the correct long-range behavior of our charge, we can just correct it. Oh. Okay. So, now, this was a calculation, uh, this is just uh, to demonstrate, it's not giving any reasonable number, it's just to demonstrate uh, the problem. So, what you can see is, uh, on the x-axis is the inverse supercell size, so this is our smallest cell, this is basically the so-called dilute limit, and what we are interested in is to get this number, and what you can do is some, um, some extrapolation. Uh, and what you can see if, if you compare this binding energy from the positive, uh, from the charged supercell with the binding energy calculated from the neutral supercell is that we have a much more pronounced finite size effect. So we get, get rid of the uh, exchange correlation function, but the price we have to pay, as we see here, is that we have a, a larger um, uh, supercell size dependent. This is, but somehow a little bit counterintuitive, yeah? We have this special optimization scheme with basically no charge in our supercell, but we see yet a stronger finite, cell, uh, finite size effect. Where does it come from? And this turns back to uh, Fekas Polaron, uh, which you have to go even more back into the literature, and uh, which was basically, which you can derive from the Fröbelich Hamiltonian and the strong coupling uh, at the Abatic limit. And uh, what they assumed is basically the charge interacting with rigid ions. And uh, the uh, dielectric constant of this continuous medium, they, um, uh, they, they used uh, basically this well known difference of the uh, high frequency dielectric constants. Um, which basically describes the polarization of the uh, electrons uh, without moving the ions, and this is the, uh, the static dielectric constant which describes basically the polarization or the linear response of the uh, whole system, so electrons plus ions. And what you can do is you can calculate the slope, and what we can find not even for magnesium oxide, but we also did it for gallium oxide and titanium oxide for electron and whole system, is that basically this slope is uh, exactly this uh, uh, related to what they use at the long range, as long range potential in the PICO model. And so we are really confident uh, that this also matches uh, uh, with this neutral supercell size approach because basically what we do is we correct the forces as there would be a charge uh, to, to adapt to uh, this uh, polarant uh, geometry. So this is basically exactly equivalent, I mean, initial equivalent of the Fekker polarant. 
Moreover, uh, what you can see is uh, you can add the correction here. Uh, here I added just uh, to confirm this picture that we really have captured the right slope, is you can just remove the, uh, the polarization of the electrons, basically, from this uh, charged binding curve. And what we can see also here, again, confirming that this and this slope gives uh, the same, uh, have the same slope. And what you can find, basically, for Stefan Lani, uh, this is basically uh, the, uh, the, the uh, error in the exchange correlation functional, which you aim uh, to cancel for hybrid functionals. Okay, as I promised, now a better picture. Uh, this is a rather, uh, uh, yeah, uh, much information in it. So uh, what you can see here is basically the magnesium oxide uh, whole polarin using the neutral cell approach and uh, as a function of the inverse supercell size. And again, for all pro uh, properties, so the binding energy, the polarin level, and the relaxation energy, we see a strong dependence. And but again, what we can see is that we have a drastically reduced dependence on the exchange correlation functional. So this is, for example, the result of the HSC with alpha equal one, and this is the result for the PPE functional. So and now we can add uh, our correction and check if we really match the dilute limit, and this is given by the solid lines. Uh, and what you can see here, even for the smallest cell, uh, so these are 216 atoms, uh, adding this correction uh, gives already, or matches quite good uh, the dilute limit of the uh, polar and binding energy. And the same we find uh, for uh, the polar and level. Okay, uh, here I want to uh, talk a little bit more about uh, where this connection basically comes from between picker polarin and DFT. And what we can do is basically looking at our cone effective mass theory. Here I only uh, did it for one band, but you can generalize it. So what you have is basically your perfect system. And what you have is a, a perturbation, which in our case is the polarin potential. And if you go far enough away from this distortion, you can basically uh, separate this problem into uh, two uh, equations. Basically, this is solving the perfect one. And then you have, have to solve um, uh, the equation for the perturbation potential. And what you, can, what, we, what you get is basically is that you get an energy uh, shifting uh, at the, the level of the corresponding um, uh, orbital uh, inside the gap, and we get an envelope times the original functional. And this is basically what we can also observe um, uh, at our calculations here for the whole polarin in magnesium oxide. It's basically a p orbital just uh, with an envelope um, times an envelope which really comes just from uh, the uh, uh, long-range interaction uh, with the LO phonomons. Okay, this brings me to my conclusions. Um, what I've shown you is a detailed analysis um, of uh, following uh, simulations uh, using density functional theory and a supercell size approach. Uh, the charged supercell size show a strong dependence on the exchange correlation approximation, but a weak supercell size dependence. So, which means if you have a large enough cell, you basically, uh, basically uh, the correction is almost um, uh, negligible. I mean, it's really, uh, really, really tiny. In, uh, in this newly derived uh, neutral supercell approach, there we see a weak exchange correlation um, um, dependent on the exchange correlation functional, but a stronger uh, supercell size dependence. But this can be corrected uh, as before using the Freisold correction scheme. Uh, but now with this uh, different um, potential, 
long range potential, which leads to the fact that we basically can simulate small polaroids in a moderately sized supercell using uh, same local functionals. However, this again, as the, uh, the analysis shows, uh, is basically only uh, quantitatively, only within uh, the adiabatic approximation. And this brings me to my uh, outlook, the polar and potential energy surface. So what I did here is, so what, what we actually wanted to do, we wanted now, okay, we have a nice method, we can use PBE, a cheap functional, now we can do uh, MD calculations, and um, yeah, and we are happy. So, but before this, I started to uh, check uh, explicitly the potential energy surface, and what I did here is basically in a neutral supercell size approach, um, uh, uh, natural elastic band uh, calculation to get this path, where 11 corresponds to uh, the following uh, minimum. And what you can see again here is a, a strong supercell size dependent, but there is a barrier here, which becomes smaller and smaller. And if we add uh, the final size correction to all of these points, uh, then we see that this uh, barrier vanishes, which is really not nice. Um, and that this is somehow what we should expect, can we again see from the picker polaron model, uh, which predicts basically that the binding energy is a parabola. And what I did here is for each uh, uh, point, I did calculate the polaron radii. So you can, uh, you can map it on the x axis. And uh, then what you can see is if you fit this picker on polaron parabola to this minimum, uh, you really see that there actually should be no barrier. So this is like a little bit disappointing. This neutral supercell size approach cannot be used out of the box for example, a molecular uh, dynamic simulations uh, because it would simply give you the wrong statistic, right? Uh, um, this uh, polaron basically, if you use a small cell, would just pop here and uh, forth, but actually it is the wrong behavior. Um, nevertheless, to finding uh, the initial uh, uh, polaron geometry, this is still a nice method because you can uh, use it uh, to, um, to find the polaron geometry. The good message is if you use the church supercell approach, that's the same curve, uh, uh, the potential energy is much more reasonable. So uh, there is still something here, might be to numerical inaccuracy, but what you can see is in a charged supercell approach gives you much more reasonable uh, polar and potential energy than in a neutral supercell approach. So that's basically a bad message because this means for MD calculations, we still have to use HSE. And another one, my uh, final point is um, uh, um, migration barriers. What you can do is you can check the also like this was uh, the potential energies surface in the direction from uh, perfect to polarin, but you can also describe from polarin to polarin uh, uh, side hopping. And what you can get is uh, much, much, much lower uh, migration barriers. And, and this is also uh, a little bit worrisome, but because this is just without any zero point uh, uh, normalization, nor any uh, considering any finite temperature. So the polar and hopping barrier, at least in this material I have observed, is much smaller than the actual binding energy. And this brings me back to Xavier, who already, uh, I already had a discussion, uh, always uh, said, if, if there is any barrier coming close to, uh, to your LO um, uh, phonon frequency, then you should always worry about uh, non adiabatic effects. So, so to really, there is really a need to go beyond the adiabatic approximation to, uh, to qualitatively and quantitatively uh, predict tolerance. 
And with this, I'd like to uh, thank you. And yeah, I'm happy to get some questions. Thank you for this very interesting and I would say frank and honest uh, presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you. Uh, I was puzzled a bit about uh, if you can show the graph with finite size effects on the potential energy surface. Okay, so you correct the first, let's say second and third point, but between different sizes of supercells, they are already the same. So, and you basically, I suppose, correct there uh, a supercell with a charge that is kind of the localized. So. I'm not sure if the, this correction should be applied because, I mean, you see the point that the second point, for instance, it goes quite low in the energy, but between three, 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 four, 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 five, five, it's already kind of converged. So I would, a scheme for correction should go uh, to the dilute limit and it does not. So do you think this is the truth? Because I mean, also from other point of view, um, as we go from the localized to localized state, there should be a barrier. I think someone on the first day talked about it, that it's just some states have to go out and there is a barrier. So how do you see that point, uh, correcting that point there? Yeah, um, uh, Christoph Reisold showed also in his paper that you can use uh, basically this correction scheme also for the delocalized tails. And why this is the same here is, uh, so what you can see really if you watch the movie is you get this kind of envelope and it uh, starts to form, like it's really continuous, uh, like as you would expect in the adiabatic uh, potential energy surface. And if it is really delocalized, uh, it's, uh, uh, you can apply the same um, uh, correction uh, giving you, but then, of course, there is basically no substantial difference giving you the same um, uh, correction. So, uh, there is no limitation uh, uh, in this uh, Freisold correction scheme to, um, uh, yeah, with more delocalized states. Uh, but, so, but, also, all these correction schemes, they are benchmarked, right, by comparing with uh, increasing the cell size. So, still there is this point of this, that you increase the cell size, there is no difference, and then you kind of, this point that would represent the dilute limit is much lower. So, why is there no size dependence? So, uh, so this correction scheme works all the same. Uh, basically, you have a model uh, charge distribution uh, where you can calculate the lattice sum from. So that's basically the uh, spurious interaction of all uh, the uh, images. This you remove, mm -hmm. and you add basically the, the isolated one. And this correction scheme is uh, not limited. Um, is not limited by uh, by any delocalization as far as you can give the correction um, a. Uh, a, 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 a model, uh, a charge model. So if you have a, a charge model for this distribution, you can calculate the correction. Okay, um, we can talk later, yeah. thank you. Other questions? Uh, yes, uh, that's correct. Um, uh, this is a little bit more tricky. So, because in FHIMs we don't have uh, it for the hybrids, so what I did there is I used a, for epsilon infinity to get um, it for, uh, for, for the hybrids, I did calculate uh, ox a charged oxy o oxygen vacancy. And there, from the tail, you can also derive uh, the, uh, um, the uh, dielectric constant. And for uh, PPE, I used uh, DFPT uh, methods. 
Yeah. So basically, uh, epsilon zero is basically if you have uh, if you calculate the slope of this uh, extrapolation uh, of uh, a relaxed charge uh, vacancy, and um, for for epsilon infinity, we used uh, the unrelaxed um, vacancy, and we extrapolated it from that. It's not really accurate, but uh, like the like uh, the changes even uh, for example for for going from PPE to Huffy Fock method uh, uh, epsilon zero is for example there ten point five or something like this and for HSE alpha equal one you get uh, nine or something like this and so you have really uh, small differences it's more more uh, critical for epsilon Infinity. Uh, two small points here. Your title contains small. So how small is small? And second, can you look at surfaces as well with this approach? Uh, in principle, yes. But then you need to not, uh, you have to extend uh, it to um, uh, to to surfaces. This correction scheme, um, which is basically again just. Uh, electrostatic, so it's, yeah, I think uh, uh, doable, uh, but I haven't done it yet. And small, yeah, I don't know if I have, uh, no. Ten, ten unit cells. No, this is uh, 50 really, unit cells. Um, so what we really have here is a picker uh, up initial version of the Pekka polaron. And uh, for the Pekka polaron, you can calculate um, uh, at any coupling things uh, the uh, uh, polaron, no matter if it is reasonable or not. I think it's the same for, uh, for a DFT calculation. If you have a large enough cell, you will always find a polaron. Right. So how do you deal with uh, how do you deal with this uh, by using a model uh, for a large part for a small polaron? And so and ultimately this means uh, how to treat uh, long range and short range this uh, interaction. Well it's really puzzling because like uh, like of course a pick up polaron is not really uh, useful because you have strong interaction uh, derived from a, a continuous media. But what we observe is really that the polaron wave function is an envelope which is basically only given by the distortion times uh, your, 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 band, uh, your, your wave function and the band act, uh, edges. So, and this is really even for, like, uh, we did also calculate in gallium, uh, gallium oxide where you can really find even stronger localized uh, polarons and this holds. So it's basically um, even uh, for very, very small followers in a DFT approximation, it's somehow just uh, an envelope which is due to a lattice distortion uh, times your bent edges. So this is what we observe. And of course, it sounds a little bit contradicting, but basically, uh, what I've shown for magnesium oxide, there is nothing more than than this, and this is uh, exactly the, the description of the the, the pickup polaron, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean it's actually what you. Uh, it doesn't mean that you uh, uh, maybe find this polaron in an experiment, because as I've said. Uh, like the migration barriers are uh, quite small, considering zero uh, for, um, uh, zero uh, renormalization effect, maybe already lifts your state above this barrier, and then maybe you again find some delocalized state. But for this bare metal uh, DFT approach, it's basically the uh, picker analogous. Uh, yeah. 